All right. Hey, everyone can hear me. So I was told to use this mic because this one's been giving them problems. Um, usually I don't need a mic because I'm really loud and hopefully I stay in frame because I tend to pace when I present, which when people video me, they absolutely hate it. So you're welcome. This is a good start. Hey, there we go. It's a shaker. It's like a shake weight. Ah. Well yeah. If you were in on the joke, that'd be a lot funnier. So uh, my name's Andrew Hay, Chief Operating Officer at Laris, uh, CXO, really. I pretty much do whatever's needed of me. I'm the fixer. Uh, I've been a CISO. I've been an engineering manager. I've done a whole bunch of things. Uh, but what's really fun for me is because as soon as Brian told me that this was going to be held at the Aviva, I said, I don't care what you say. I'm doing my rugby talk. <laughs> and he didn't fight me on it. Uh, or if he did, I just ignored the email. But uh, I'm giving my, my rugby leadership talk, which is kind of cool for me doing it here. Uh, I'm, I'm a strength and conditioning coach. I'm a competitive power lifter. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It keeps me sane, but the, of all the training I've had in coaching rugby, as soon as I was sitting through the sessions and running through the skills and drills and exercises, I was drawing immediate parallels to rugby. And what what's great is as I'm doing all this training, I'm like, this is going to be a talk someday. And lo and behold, it's a talk someday. <laughs> all right. So a little bit about Laris. We've been in business for 15 years. Uh, we are a DeMovo company. We've got a table upstairs. If you want to talk more about that, we can. I'm not here to sell you. I'm here to tell you about security leadership. So a lot of people. So who who here, show of hands, has served in the military. All right. So that type of leadership style, which has been around for thousands of years, is very autocratic. You are told what to do. You are told how to do it. And the expectation is set that you do that. I was in the Canadian Navy for a year for that reason. Wasn't really for me. And not everyone can be led that way. People just aren't receptive to a blanket approach to training. And it's very, like, if you've ever watched an American football movie, you'll know what I mean by autocratic coaching because it's this coach who's standing on the sidelines just screaming at his players to do what he says because that's the way to do it. And now imagine yourself in that person's shoes trying to teach toddlers how to play soccer or how to play rugby. Do you think that's going to work? What's going to happen to those toddlers? You're going to have people laying on the ground, little people bursting into tears. Yeah, they will be children. They will act like children. So that is, I'm not saying that we should teach people like children, but there are some parallels that we can draw and move away from the autocratic coaching method when we are training people about security. So it's not suitable for everybody. Everyone learns differently. Everyone reacts differently. But this is really just a way to give you something else to work with. So everyone, it's basic human nature. We want to feel important. We want to feel like we are contributing to not only our success, but the success or the movement towards a goal that we're all working towards. And it's... This is really the basis for the Olympic coaching style and R Olympic coaching methodologies that World Rugby has drawn from. So what they teach World Rugby coaches all over the world is the exact same methodology they teach Olympic coaches because it works. It's more about encouragement, forming a strong relationship between the coach and the athletes, or in our case, the security leaders and the security doers or operations people. And it's, if you think about it, it's giving your players or your, your security team members 
the tools to make decisions so that they can feel that accomplishment that they've come up with something. And I'm not saying it's going to be the right answer every time, but people learn from their mistakes. That's how we learn things. So the only thing I hope you take away from this talk is maybe thinking differently, not only about leading security teams, but how you may respond to better leadership. And when it comes to an annual review, perhaps you say, well, you know, I think this might be a better way for me to succeed in this role if I'm led in this type of manner. So again, another tool for your managerial tool belt or to tell your manager how you would like to be led because everyone's different. So we have two different models. There's the coach centric or coach centered coaching style, which if I'm the coach, it's all about me. So I'm going to show you or tell you what needs to be done. Uh, I'm going to sh give you the techniques to do it. Is any of this starting to sound like school? This, this is how we do math. This is how we do science. This is calculus. This is the step-by-step -step process for filling or figuring out this equation. It's step-by-step, -step, no deviation, show your work. And that is how we've been taught over the years, but not everyone learns that way. We have, as society, have evolved in the way that we consume and digest information. So this, probably one of the biggest things in the coach-centered coaching style is you're telling someone and then either showing them how to do it, how you want it done, or you're telling them how to do it and then you're making them show you. Whereas the player centered, it's all around the individual. You're giving them the tools to figure out how to reach that end goal. So you're setting up, you're giving them the basics that they need to function in their role. And you're saying, this is the objective that we want to get to. Now, there are many ways to get to that objective. I would like you and your teammates or team members to figure out how to get to that point. And maybe as a coach, I'll learn something, a better way to take that information, like, hey, that's the way we're going to do it from now on, because that's the better way to do it, not something that's come up in the past. So you need to be able to do both methods, because like I said, everyone's different. Some people, if, so in rugby, especially in North America, we have a lot of ex- American football players come out to try rugby and they're used to that coach centered. Tell me what to do. I have no idea what I'm doing. Tell me what I should be doing, where I should go, because that's how they've learned since they were little children where you get rugby players from Ireland, from South Africa. They've been given that creative knowledge to figure out problems as they go. And I don't know if that's why there's a high number of Irish and South African, not only rugby players, but actuaries and accountants, but it, there's some parallels there. You know, they're, they have to figure things out on their own and, uh, get to the end goal. So how do you coach? And this is something they teach in like the first 10 minutes of any coaching leadership course is you're going to, instruct slash explain what you, what the expectations are. You're going to demonstrate it. You're going to stand back. You're going to observe and assess what's going on and digest what you're seeing. And then you're going to provide feedback. This is the best way to do it instead of saying, all right, go do this. No, no, no. You're doing it wrong. Do it this way. Do it this way instead. You're not giving people a chance to actually do something. So how do we really apply this in the security realm? You might be thinking here. So as part of the instruction and demonstration phase, before you even start speaking, you have to plan what you're going to go up and say. Because if you go up there in front of a room and just make it up on the fly, 
You could screw up. You could lose the confidence of everyone you're speaking to, especially if it's in front of a, a huge class, uh, in front of a team. So make sure you know what you're going to say before you go up there. So you have that confidence. And you can even start thinking of, well, what if this doesn't resonate? Okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll draw on these ideas and I'll frame it in a different way. So as you get up, you get everyone's attention. Make sure everyone's focused on you so that no one's having side conversations or chats in the back because you want their focus on you so that they have no excuses for not understanding or at least not hearing the initial presentation of what you're asking them to do. And you want to make sure that you are keeping the message very short and simple. You don't want to say, hey, I'm Andrew. Uh, we are going to talk about this thing and then talk about that thing for 20 minutes and then say, all right, now go do the first thing I said 20 minutes ago because they're going to forget. That's a lot of information to digest. It's all bite-sized chunks that you want to feed them. And then make sure everyone ins understands. I'm sure we've all been in that situation where you're standing next to people and someone says, everyone understand? And they all kind of look around. They're like, yeah, yeah, we understand. But you know half the group does not understand. Or someone's afraid to say, no, I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean. Can, can you explain it more or does it mean this? They don't want to do that because they don't want to look bad in front of their peers. They want to be able to fit in and then just try and figure it out as they go. So in our world, all right, so I'm going to get everyone's attention. I'm going to explain the scenario that we're going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to make sure that I ask those questions. I don't want to forget to ask questions and make sure everything or everyone understands what I'm saying. Now, I'm going to get their attention. Hey, everyone, can everyone hear me? Uh, we're going to get started on this phishing email identification scenario. And, you know, so everyone pay attention. We're going to get started here right now. So we're going to keep it very, very simple. So I'd like everyone to look at the three emails and discuss with your partner if they look legitimate or more like phishing emails. I'll give you two minutes per email, and then we'll discuss. Whichever team has the best analysis is declared the winner. So those are three points that I've communicated. I want everyone to look at the three emails. I want them to discuss with their partner if they look like phishing emails. And then you have two minutes per email. And the cherry on top is whoever gives the best answer at the end, you're the winner. You can give them a prize. It could be a high five. You'd be amazed at how many people will do something just for a high five. It seems silly, but it works. So now I'm going to recap just to make sure everyone understands and then ask if anyone has questions. All right. So three emails, two minutes each. Discuss the features with your partner. Does it make sense? Does anyone have any questions? So at this point, if you get the feeling that there are some people that do understand, but others that don't, you have an option. You can ask the people that you know or that you feel do not understand the question, which puts them on the spot, which may make them shut down. Or you can ask a question that reinforces what you've asked them of one of the people that you know gets it. Say, so, all right, Dave, so how many emails are we going to look at? Dave, how many emails are we going to look at? Dave Lewis, how many emails are we going to look at? <laughs> there you go. It's on the slide. Thanks for playing along, Dave. <laughs> Katie, how much time do we have? Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. And so that way, you're picking on people that know the answer, and they're reinforcing it for everyone else that may have not heard you, may have not been paying attention, but you're just feeding them that little tidbit of information. And that may resonate more hearing from a peer as opposed to the coach or the leader. So why do we, why do we check for questions? We want to make sure that they have the knowledge of what we have asked. If they can comprehend exactly what it is we've asked, and then can they apply what we've asked? Now, each individual 
that is part of this scenario or part of this exercise, we can ask them this because we can gauge how they analyze particular situations. So this is something to tuck back in your head if you know that they're very good at this type of instruction in this type of scenario and can go through the analysis, you can tuck that away. Like, all right, this, this team might be the team that I want to use in an incident response exercise because they can synthesize and analyze this type of information very quickly. And there's no question about it. And you're just evaluating them as they go. So. Always ask questions. Do not be afraid to ask questions of the people you know have answers. And if they come to you after, like, why are you always picking on me? Because I know you're going to know the answer. And I'm making sure that you, as a leader on this team, can share the information with your peers. So I've just reinforced their ego. Oh, my boss thinks that I know things. This is great. And my boss trusts me to lead the team and share my inf insight with the team to make sure they understand so they can follow my lead. Those are two very positive things for the ego. All right, now we're going to demonstrate it. So you want to position yourself so everyone can see. That's why we always stand at the front of a classroom. We don't stand at the back because if you're standing at the back, you can see that everyone's looking forward, but they're not necessarily looking at you. One of the greatest things I've ever learned from a rugby coach is when you are telling someone what you're basically asking them to do something, never stand with the lights behind you. Why is that? Does anyone want to wager a guess? They can't see you properly because they're squinting because lights are really bright. If you're up here, you'd know how bright the friggin' lights are up here. So they can't see you properly, so they're going to struggle to see. They may have to put their hand up and just it's, it's a distraction that you don't want. So always stand with the light behind them so that you as the coach are the only one struggling to look at them. And it's the same way. Like, don't stand off to the side. Don't sit down casually. Ask them of something. Stand in front where everyone can see you because you're instructing, you're providing the scenario or the instructions for the scenario so that they can hear and understand and execute on what you're asking. You're going to focus the attention on those one to two points so that they don't go off on a tangent somewhere. It's just one or two things that you're asking them to look at. And you can repeat a demo once, twice, until you're sure that they understand. And then again, you're asking them questions, inviting feedback. What do you need in order to succeed? All right, does everyone understand? So it's all about asking questions. So who here has played rugby? You, sir. Come on up. This will be good. This is always really fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What's your name? Ed. Ed. I'm Ed. Here. Oh. Now you're on the mic. Explain to me how to perform a sidestep. <laughs> okay, so I'm running towards you. I'm going one way, then I go to the other. Just like I'm just as simple here, as that. And then, then just side go over here. <laughs> I mean, that's a slow down version. <laughs> slow down version. All right. So let's say I have the ball. And I'm running towards you. You're the defender. How would you instruct me to perform a sidestep? So I'm taking one step, doing another step. Dump, dummy one way. Dummy one way. Which is going to make me go this way. Yeah. And then you're going to switch direction. And then I'm going to switch directions over here. That's great. That's very clear. Does everyone understand that? Does it make sense? All right. Give me a hand. Thank you. High five. High five. High five. Yeah. Everyone give him a high five. <laughs> He's earned it. The best picture I could find, by the way, because <laughs> everyone loves a prop that can step. So this is the verbatim process provided by USA Rugby on how to perform a sidestep. It's a little bit more verbose and goes into more detail than what you said. But so you're targeting the nearest defender. You're running towards them to fix the position. You're going to change direction close to them because if you if you change directions too early, they're going to know where you're going to go and they'll adjust accordingly. And you're going to quickly 
push sideways off one foot and then change directions. And then, you know, accelerate away from the defender. That, that's the part I always have the hard time with. But, uh, I'm not built for speed. But like these, this is, this is called key factor coaching. So you're telling them step by step how to execute a sidestep. Coming back to our security scenario. All right. So this might be something that you do 10 minutes into the scenario. If you see people are struggling or maybe you do this after you've explained everything. So there's a couple of scenarios where, or methodologies where you're doing, it's called, um, what is it? Uh, half, half, half full, and then half full, half. So where you're giving them half the information and then you're letting them do it. And then you're coming in after and giving them the other half of the information that you wanted to give them. Or you're giving them the first half, making sure they understand. You're giving them the second half, making sure they understand that and then let them go and do the full exercise. So completely dependent on your style and how you like to communicate. But, uh, again, we're going to stand. This is the demonstration. We're stand at the front of the class. See, make sure everyone can see us. We're going to pull a scenario or an example. So before we get started, let's take a look at a sample email. This is one that you haven't looked at yet. Uh, note the suspicious email address when I hover over the sender's name. Also note the sender's asking me to send strangely sensitive information that maybe they would never ask me to send. So that's something that you should note for your exercise. This might show up in your emails that you look at. All right, uh, number two shows the expected email address when we hover over it, but the email is also asking for expected information that the sender asks for. So is that suspicious? Is it not? You'd probably have to dig in a little bit deeper. So these are just two things to show you what you could be looking for. So I'm repeating the demo a second time. And then make sure that everyone understands by saying these are just a couple of samples. You may see more information. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we get started? So again, this is the time where I usually find people are more open to asking questions because they've, they've synthesized and digested everything from the first uh, set of instructions. They've been shown what they're looking for. And at this point, it's usually a binary, you know, either they get it or they don't get it, and they're more willing to jump in and say, well, you know, what do we do if blah? You know, could, could we look at this? Like, yes, that's a great way to look for it. Apply that to your emails or apply that to the exercise. Work with your partners if you, if you don't understand or you have questions. So now this is probably my favorite part because I'm a very judgy person, but you're going to look at the different key factors, each key factor at a time. You're going to observe from different angles. So if you see a coach, they're not going to stand static or they have assistant coaches that are walking around the different exercises. Just like in classrooms, if it's a large classroom, you will generally have proctors that are walking by to help or the head instructor will be walking, making sure no one's having problems or has any questions that might pop up. Uh, you internalize at this point anything that you notice that might not be working properly, or they may not be executing based on the instructions that you've given. And then in your head, you determine what could we do at this point? All right, do, do we build on the positives on the strengths of what they're really good at and what they're moving forward with? Do we emphasize the correction of some of the errors that they've made? Or do we do nothing, let them figure it out? You know, that I know a bunch of our speakers have young children or had young children at one time. Um, Katie, I'm going to pick on you again. Your first child, teaching them to walk. Was it a, all right, I'm just going to drag you along here until you start moving your feet and I can let go. Yeah, that one, that model. All right. 
<laughs> or more likely, um, encouragement and yeah, <laughs> little bundle of positivity, right, sitting there in the front row, is encouragement to take those steps to come to mommy. Yeah, yeah. It's ringing bells now. All right, cool. <laughs> So there, there are different ways to encourage people to do things. And if, if you think back to toddlers, again, I'm not saying treat your coworkers like toddlers, even though they may need to be treated like toddlers. Uh, but when you're instructing someone to do something, gauge their skill level and how they can be enticed to succeed and to move forward with what you're asking at their own rate. So sometimes it's easier just to let them figure it out themselves. I think, what is it, ferberizing? When you let kids cry to sleep? Yeah, no, no, that's, that's too new school for me. I don't think I could have handled that. <laughs> it's like, let them cry to sleep. They'll figure it out themselves. No, I'll lose my damn mind. Not happening. But it works for certain people. Now, feedback is always a very important thing, not just for the individuals to, again, check understanding, but for the coach or the, the leader as well. So there's two methods. There's push feedback where you're directly asking questions. And you may know this sometimes is referred to as a shit sandwich. Because you'll get bad news first, then really, really good news, and then bad news again. And what do you think people remember in the shit sandwich? They remember the bad news because that was the last thing. And that's what they'll focus on because that's the last thing they heard. They're not going to say, I'm going to ignore those two horrible things you just said about me and focus on that one good thing you said about me. As humans, we're not going to do that. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of the push feedback method where you're just like cramming it down their throat. I like the pull method. And this is what world rugby really wants us to go towards because this is making sure that people understand things. So at the end of every training session uh, that we run in Austin, we always grab the core leaders and we ask them what went well with that training session today? You know, what, what didn't go well? What could we improve on? And what, what should we do better next time? What are your thoughts for that? And it gives them a chance to sit back and think, well, what could we do better? You know, maybe this didn't resonate well for half the, half the team involved in the exercise. Uh, maybe it was dead on. Everyone understood we could do it this way again. So this is a great thing to do, especially if you're doing a training exercise or a tabletop exercise. You always want this feedback. What, you know, what worked? What worked really well? And I end all of my tabletop exercises with this pull feedback questions because I want to know if it worked for them. And if not, I'd probably want to change it next time around. And then as the instructor, I always pull it back or point it back to me. All right. Well, as the instructor or as the facilitator of this exercise, what did I do well? You know, was I clear? Did I use too much profanity, which is entirely possible for me? Uh, did I not explain things well? What, what didn't I explain well? What, how could I have explained it better for the audience that would have worked for this organization? And that helps me improve as a coach and as a leader because now I can refine that and tuck that away and work on that myself. So just to summarize, and I think I may have gotten us back on track, um, Businesses will typically lead using that command and control top-down structure because that's the way we've been taught that leadership works for thousands of years. It's a militaristic, top-down approach that doesn't work for everybody. So of the individuals that have been in the military, I believe, sir, you put your head up. What branch? Army. All right. So if your sergeant came to you and said, hey, we're going to go on a 20 kilometer run. Is that okay? 
Like, are, are you are you fine with that? Is this good for you today that we can do this, or would you rather postpone it? Maybe do, maybe we could rest. We could have uh, we could sit inside, maybe read a book, go over some field manuals, and then we'll run whenever it suits you. Wouldn't that have been crazy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't really work for me today, Sergeant. Uh, I, I would I'd rather not do this. Let's. It's raining outside. I don't like to run in the rain. You know that. We've had this discussion before. Now, if we were in an organization that isn't this top-down approach, this military approach, this is a reasonable conversation to have. Hey, we're going to run this tabletop today. You know, it's half the people said they can make it. The other half couldn't. Do you think we should move this? What does everyone feel? Should we move this to another date where we could get full involvement It's not, well, you go tell those people to get off the phones, drop everything they're doing, and get to this class because this is when I scheduled it for. That is not going to work very well. You're, you're going to have a lot of special meetings with, uh, with your superiors after that because you'd be viewed as a tyrant. Sometimes you have to be a tyrant for things to work. Other times, most of the time, you don't. You want to work as a team and encourage them. So, One of the things that I learned very early on with coaching is that it's not about me. If my team wins, it's not because I was a good coach, which is probably the complete opposite of American football. If the team wins, it's because the coach was amazing. If the team loses, it's because the team didn't follow what the coach said they should have done. But that's not how business works. If we fail, we fail as a team. We all failed. You know, if I'm leader, if I'm the leadership, then it's a failure from me that I didn't instill the proper training or I didn't provide the proper training avenues for you to succeed. You may have done some things along the way, but it's likely not just your sole problem that caused the entire failure of a particular process. So it's not about you. It's not about the coach. And it's it's just about the team that he or she assembles. So using this player-centered, player-centric coaching style uh, will really help you grow and understand your team, your place within the team, and help you get better as not just a security leader, but as someone that is part of the overall organization. Uh, if If you would have told me this when I started my career, I would have sat there and said, that's bullshit. You know, that's someone else's problem. That's not my problem. I'm not the part of a team. I'm, you know, I'm a call center agent. Nothing I do matters. Now, as an adult, uh, I realize that's not the case because there's a lot of things that influence my overall success and the success of the company if I do a good job. And if we do a good job as a team, there are benefits that we reap as a result of that. But it's not something we think of when, you know, we're just getting into the workforce because we're just a tiny cog in this huge machine, but it's still an integral cog that needs to turn for the entire machine to work. So with that, this is some really good reference material that I found. And there's, so the Team USA Olympic and Paralympic Coaches Magazine, wealth of information on just general leadership and how to lead, how to be led, how to ask to be led, and fantastic information. There's also this extremely long link uh, released by the International Olympic Community Committee on the qualities of what a great coach is. The next time you're asked to interview your future boss, this is a great resource to take a look at. Like, are you going to coach me in the way that I need to be coached in order to succeed? in this role, in future roles. And road rugby coaching, by far the basis for a lot of this coaching methodology. And it is written in such a way that it's applicable to, you know, toddlers, to the minis, all the way to professional rugby athletes. All this methodology is followed. So with that, we probably don't have time for questions, uh, but I'll be... I'll be around drinking after the sessions. So you can find me there.
Uh, well, it depends how much I have to drink. So we'll 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 play it by ear. <laughs> All right. Thank you.